Uh, I think we'll get this seminar started. And my name is Desmond Lochman, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the AI this afternoon. And I'm looking forward to a, a very lively discussion about a topic that is rather important, quantitative easing by the world's major central banks. Uh, in late 2008, uh, in response to the global economic crisis, and as interest rates approached their lower zero bound, the Federal Reserve began its first round of quantitative easing. Uh, it did so by buying mortgage-backed securities in the secondary market. This was followed by two further rounds of quantitative easing, uh, involving the purchase of large amounts, this time of both U.S. Treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Uh, by the time that the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing program ended in late 2014, uh, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet had expanded from something like uh, $800 billion at the start of the program to $4.5 trillion by the end of the program. Uh, the Federal Reserve, of course, wasn't the only central bank engaged in quantitative easing during this period. Uh, we had, indeed, uh, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan all engaged in similar kind of programs with differences, of course, but involving purchases of assets in the secondary market. Uh, with inflation still very low in both Japan and Europe, both the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank uh, are continuing to do those purchases, although uh, this week the, cent the European Central Bank has intimated that they might be putting an end to that uh, process. Uh, the actions of these central banks uh, has had a major impact on global liquidity as evidenced by a $10 trillion increase in the combined size of their balance sheets. Uh, that, in turn, has succeeded in producing a synchronized global economic recovery. However, it has also had a major impact on asset prices, and it has led to the substantial compression of interest rate spreads uh, that could have implications for future economic performance. Uh, it struck me and Alex Pollock, uh, who has helped me put this seminar uh, together, uh, that 10 years on with quantitative easing, uh, it would be a good time to take stock of the results of what is fair to say uh, is the great monetary policy experiment of our times. Uh, this last week's turbulence in global financial markets, stemming from events in Italy, and seeming to be spreading to emerging markets, including countries like Brazil, uh, would seem to make the seminar all the more timely. There are a variety of questions that might be addressed. How successful was the experiment with quantitative easing in avoiding deflation and promoting economic recovery, uh, not to mention preventing us from slipping into another great economic risk? depression. What have been the unintended consequences of those policies? How challenging will monetary policy normalization and the reduction in the size of the central bank's balance sheets be? Should quantitative easing be used in combating the next recession when it comes? These are some of the questions that deserve attention. Uh, to address these questions, I first will have a conversation with Chairman Ben Bernanke, and we'll immediately follow that uh, with a uh, conversation by discussion of a panel of highly qualified experts. Chairman Bernanke will leave at that stage, uh, and I ask you to please remain seated to allow him to leave easily. Before starting the conversation with Chairman Bernanke, I should say how very honored and fortunate we feel to have him be with us this afternoon. Uh, Chairman Bernanke has unparalleled policy, economic policy experience, having served first as chair of the Council of Economic Advisers and then two full terms as chairman of the Federal Reserve. In the latter capacity, he was the principal architect of the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing program. 
As if that were not enough, Chairman Bernanke is internationally recognized as a preeminent scholar of monetary policy with the deepest of knowledge of both the Great Depression and the Japanese economy. So I can't imagine somebody more qualified to be talking about this subject. Uh, please join me in welcoming Chairman Bernanke. Once again, thank you very much for doing this. I thought maybe a good place to start uh, would be uh, if you could just give us a brief indication as to why were three rounds of quantitative easing uh, required? What were they trying to do? How successful uh, were they? Yeah, well, first, uh, thanks for inviting me to your beautiful place here. Lovely. Um, so as we, you already introduced the idea of why quantitative easing was introduced in the first place. I think sometimes the discussion makes it sound like this was something we did on a whim, you know. But, but uh, in 2008, late 2008, early 2009, the, those fourth quarter of 2008 and the first quarter of 2009 were the two worst quarters uh, of post-war U.S. history. The economy was collapsing. We saw in, when we gathered in March 2009 at the FOMC, we didn't know where the bottom was going to be. And we were seriously concerned that we were facing a new depression type situation. The staff was telling us that we needed 400 basis points more of stimulus. We had zero to give because interest rates had been at zero since the previous November. So we needed to do something. And uh, all members of the FOMC from the most dovish to the most hawkish were very strongly agreed with this was the best option we had. So we undertook a very large program. We called it LSAPs, Large Scale Asset Purchases, but the press renamed it Quantitative Easing. So be that as it may, what it consisted of was the Fed buying securities on the open market and paying for them by creating reserves in the banking system with the idea of trying to reduce further longer term interest rates and create more stimulus for the economy. Now I think the, uh, the broad sense, so there's, there's a question about benefits and costs, right? So there was a cost benefit analysis. On the benefit side, um, again, we hope that by pushing down longer term interest rates, we provide more stimulus, help the economy recover. Uh, and I think the, the great majority of studies and analyses, you, you yourself said this contributed to this globally synchronized recovery. Uh, the great majority of studies suggest that this was effective, that it did uh, ease financial conditions, did provide support for the economy, particularly QE1, which came at a time when markets were in tremendously disrupted condition, but also the, the additional rounds as well. So I think on the benefit side, it did provide support for an economy which otherwise appeared to be hurtling toward the abyss. Um, now, I think it is important, to, as we talk about this, that we get the right metric. Because sometimes you hear people say, well, this recovery was so weak. Growth was not really very good compared to, say, the recovery in the 1980s. But that's not a fair comparison for a couple of reasons. One is that the demographics of the US economy are very different today than they were in the 1980s. In the 1980s, we had a growing labor force. Now we have a labor force which is getting older, which is in perhaps coming you know, pretty much flat. Uh, so about a percentage point of the difference in growth between the 80s and recently just is accounted for by the size of the population, by the demographics. The other thing that we didn't anticipate was that productivity growth slowed a lot after the crisis. Uh, and studies that look at that suggest that that process had already begun before the crisis. So GDP growth was, was modest, but there were factors involved that were certainly outside of the Fed's control, including the demographics and the productivity gains. Now, the better metric would be not growth, but unemployment and job creation. And there, the record is very good. The unemployment rate hit 10% in uh, the fall of 2009. Of course, as you know now, it's below 4%. There's been a very steady decline in unemployment, very substantial job creation. Um, and of course, maximum employment is part of the Fed's mandate. On the other side, uh, inflation uh, was, it was a concern. We were concerned that with the, the depth of the recession, we might see very, very low inflation or even deflation. Of course, that didn't happen. Inflation stayed relatively close to the Fed's 2% target, and today is almost exactly a 2% target. So I think on the benefits side, it's been, it was positive. It, it contributed to the uh, recovery and gave us a tool where our traditional short rate mechanism was no longer available. Now, I know a lot of this discussion is going to be about the costs. Um, we approached this very carefully because we were concerned about the costs. But let me, and we'll get into that, I'm sure, but let me just say that uh, 
many of the costs that were anticipated by outsiders simply have not happened. When we did the second round of quantitative easing in November of 2010, we got a letter from Congress, followed up by a letter from a number of uh, hedge fund managers and economists imploring us not to do this terrible thing. And among the things they were concerned about was the possibility of, of hyperinflation, very high inflation, uh, a collapse of the dollar, or, or as they put it, debasing the currency. Uh, and of course, none of those things have happened. And, and indeed, markets have functioned well. And uh, the, the, the concern about exit, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, uh, while we certainly have not exited yet, the exit process has begun. The asset purchases ended in October of 2014. Now we're you know, at a process where the balance sheet is actually beginning to run off. And of course, it hasn't finished, but that also has not shown itself to be a big problem so far. So let me just, let me just sort of conclude, summarize, and answer your question, which is you know, quantitative easing was an emergency measure. The uh, effects are less certain and less well understood than ordinary interest rate management. Uh, so uh, it's not something that the Fed or other central banks are going to turn to routinely. It's an emergency measure. However, the next time that we have a deep recession and short-term interest rates hit zero, which may well happen, you know, I think it was something that's in the toolbox and is something that you know, central banks are willing to use. Yeah. Thank you. The whole process took the Fed into totally uncharted territory. Knowing what you know today, is there any different way that you would have done things? Or I'm thinking of the second round of quantitative easing, the third round of quantitative easing. Well, I don't think we would have been any less aggressive. I think, you know, as, as it was, we were actually fairly cautious because we didn't know exactly what the side effects might be, et cetera. Um, and as a result, perhaps the, the recovery was even a bit slower than it might otherwise have been. But I think on, on the other side, I think we, learned, we have learned a lot now about, for example, communication. Um, when, the, uh, uh, we first, when I first, as chairman, I first brewed the idea that the asset purchases might slow down, I, what I said was very accurate and so on, but as you know, we had what was called the taper tantrum where markets over-extrapolated what I said. This was 2013. In 2013 and created a lot of uh, instability in markets that didn't really seem to harm the U.S. economy, but did happen uh, as well. And what we've seen since then is, is much more caution, say, by the European Central Bank and so on, of how they carefully they communicate. So that's one of the drawbacks of quantitative easing. It's harder to communicate about it than, than short-term interest rates. So that's certainly, we've learned a lot about how to do that do that well. The other thing that we experimented with was whether to make quantitative easing a fixed quantity or whether somehow to tie it to the state of the economy. And as we moved along, we began to make it more conditional and say, here's what we're trying to achieve, and purchases will continue until such and such happens. So I think you know, we, we did learn how best to implement it. Uh, but I, you know, again, I, I think the overall feeling was that while it is an uncertain tool and one that is more difficult to use, it, it's still something worth having in the toolbox. Yeah. You're certainly right in reminding us that there were a lot of people who feared that this was really going to open the floodgates, there was going to be a lot of money sloshing around, that we would have hyperinflation and all the rest. But something that strikes me is uh, that we've had a lot of asset price inflation. So, you know, for instance, like if I look at uh, equity valuations today, global equity valuations, you know, certainly at the beginning of this year, uh, they were only experienced three times in the past hundred years, or else, you know, we've got a lot of housing bubbles. Uh, I'm thinking of Australia, Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, parts of the United States. Uh, my question is, is that an inevitable part of quantitative easing? I mean, should the Fed be concerned about asset price inflation? So uh, some of the countries you mentioned, like Canada, didn't do quantitative easing, so... Well, no, but I'm but, thinking that... So let, I'm thinking that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we're living in is we're living in a global economy, so if you've got the Fed pumping in liquidity the one place, the European Central Bank, the other, this money has to go somewhere... Um, there are people already being forced to uh, so take so it, it is it is it's true that one way which monetary policy works in general is by encouraging risk taking and you know risk taking is like ice cream you know a certain amount is good beyond that maybe it's not so good right and after a financial crisis people are extremely cautious and extremely scared and so encouraging some risk taking at that point is probably a positive thing 
So that's part of the mechanism. It's not the only part, but it's part of the mechanism. And what it suggests is that if you do have a period of very long, a very long period of low interest rates, that you do have to be cautious. And one of the things that I did uh, at the Fed was create a whole new division, which is now uh, as big as the Monetary Policy Division, of staff uh, which, and, and a board committee whose job is to monitor financial conditions and try to make sure that you know, what, we can address that with whatever tools we have available and to keep the FOMC well informed about that. But I think the important thing, a couple of things I want to say about this, the, to the extent that this is a problem, and I think there's some, you know, I think caution suggests we need to pay very close attention to these developments, it doesn't seem to be particularly related to QE as opposed to other kinds of monetary policy. In particular, you know, the, just like the predictions of hyperinflation, the predictions of bubbles and crashes associated with these QE programs have not come true either. So for, let me just give you a few examples. In 2010, this letter I mentioned from the, the Congress, they talked about asset bubbles as being a major concern. At that time, the Dow Jones was less than 12,000. Now it's 25,000. I think a lot of that gain is not bubble. I think a lot of it reflects genuine economic growth and also low interest rates. And, and taking those two things into yeah. account, it's not obvious that stocks are wildly overvalued. They're a little bit overvalued, but not wildly. Likewise, in 2013, 2012, 2013, Jeremy Stein, a governor for whom I had tremendous respect, was talking about these issues, and he was talking about concerns about credit bubbles at that time, five years ago. There's a lot of talk about how as soon as the Fed, well, maybe things are okay now, but as soon as the Fed begins, stops asset purchases and begins to exit, we're going to have a crash. And that was, of course, we stopped asset purchases in 2014, and the exit began last year. So, yes, it's possible that at some point there'll be a problem. But again, just the Fed is looking at this very carefully, monitoring it. And secondly, we've, we've seen tremendous benefits for the economy. So I'm, I'm not that concerned about it. I think that, that actual assessments of, for example, the stock market suggest that it's not wildly overvalued. In any case, you know, uh, it seems to most of the gains are related to the progress yeah. the economy has made. I guess, you know, the concern that I have is that we're not just talking about maybe some asset markets being overvalued, uh, but we're talking about credit spreads having been incredibly compressed, you know, to levels where it might not be reflecting the risk of default. So, you know, for instance, just to give you a good example, you know, if you just take a look at emerging markets, you know, emerging market corporates, uh, this last um, six years or so, they've increased their borrowing from $10 trillion to $25 trillion. And the spreads are now at the lowest level uh, that they've been more or less historically. Uh, you know, my concern is that the jury might still be out, you know, because while the Fed has stopped the quantum easing, uh, the Bank of Japan and the, uh, the European Central Bank uh, are still at it. Uh, you know, so oh, you're not concerned that, you know, spreads when they widen, that that could cause some kind of dislocation, you know, in financial well, markets? Again. So you do have to pay attention to this, and I think it's important for the Fed. One of the things we learned in the crisis was that it wasn't enough for each regulator to look at their own little segment of the market. We did have to have a macro view, and the Fed and other regulators have taken a much more macroscopic view of this. And it rema remains to be seen. You know, I think, again, we have had this tremendous benefit. Um, I, you know, I, the point, I guess the point I would leave you with is this, that, that if you think about regular regular monetary policy with short-term interest rates, it works through very much the same channels as quantitative easing. And uh, so if you believe that monetary policy should be used to try to help stabilize the economy, you can't really argue that quantitative easing is somehow in a different category. It works through more or less the same mechanisms. Right, but might the problem be uh, that what's occurred this time around is too much of a burden has been placed on monetary policy, you know, that a more appropriate way to have dealt with this would have had a better balance between fiscal and monetary policy in the sense that had there been additional kind of fiscal stimulus or the helicopter money that at one stage uh, you propounded, uh, the Fed wouldn't have been forced uh, to go in for quantitative easing and then cause people to take a huge amount of risk. 
So again, I, I think it remains to be seen whether undue amount of risk has been taken. I think that remains to be seen. But on your main point about fiscal policy, I agree with you 100 percent. And I said this all the time. I, I begged Congress in 2014 not to raise taxes and cut spending as they did. It was the wrong time to do that. But generally speaking, Congress was not cooperating. And, and given that they were doing what they were doing, the Fed had to take that as given and do what they could. Right. Let me ask, just in terms of uh, normalization, that what the Fed's done, uh, you know, which seems to me to be eminently sensible, is they've set themselves a path by which they're going to be reducing the size of the balance sheet. You know, we're running off 20 billion for three months and then 30 billion and so on, and it eventually reaches 50 billion. But since they set that path, uh, what's happened is, uh, for whatever reason, uh, the Trump administration has decided to have a fiscal stimulus at this late stage in the cycle. Uh, my question is, does that change the calculus in some kind of way? How does uh, the fact that you've got a fiscal stimulus now, you know, what... It makes the Fed's job more difficult all around, because what you're getting is a stimulus at the very wrong moment that the economy is already at full employment. So you're getting hit by a big stimulus, which... On the current law, we'll see what happens, whether it's renewed or not, but on current law, it's going to hit the economy in a big way this year and next year. And then in 2020, the Wiley Coyote is going to go off the cliff and it's going to look down, and there'll be, that'll be essentially withdrawn at that point. So the Fed has got a much more difficult job to try to maintain non-inflationary full employment over the next three or four years, given this strong stimulus at this unusual time, followed by some withdrawal, uh, accidental, incidental withdrawal of stimulus in, in a couple years from now. But does it change the balance between what the Fed should be doing, uh, you know, in terms of uh, short-term interest rates as opposed to running off the balance sheet? Uh, in, in theory, the fact that the government, the federal government, is issuing all this additional debt might cause you to think about that combination. It's true. But the problem is, as I talked about before, is that communicating about the balance sheet is just very hard. And there's always the risk the markets will misunderstand you. The Fed is very, very happy with the fact that they were able to announce this unwind plan and get it going without any kind of market disruptions whatsoever. And so it, there's a very, very high bar for them to change because they're afraid that if they begin to, you know, vary the pace or, or make it conditional in various ways, they'll, they'll create uncertainty and volatility in financial markets. So in theory, you're right. But I think that the Fed's view is that they're so satisfied with how this has been communicated and how this process has begun, they don't want to tinker with that if at all possible. Right. But I guess, uh, you know, if we look back to 2017, uh, you know, something that surprised me was that at the beginning of 2017, the Fed set for itself an interest rate path, you know, more or less. And then it basically didn't change that interest rate path for who knows how long, 15 months or so. But my question is, is that appropriate when you have a whole bunch of things happening? You know, for a start, we had, since Trump became president, stock prices went up by 25%. Housing prices went up by 6%. That's like an $8 trillion increase in wealth. On top of that, the dollar depreciates by 10%. And if that's not enough, we then get the fiscal stimulus, yet we had the same interest rate path. You know, I'm not sure what it is that I'm missing. Well, first, um, the interest rate paths are what's called the dot plot. This is the information that comes out, it'll come out next week, the quarterly meeting that the Fed sort of gives these, um, these projections. So it's important to understand that, first of all, these are not official committee projections. They are simply the accumulation of individual participants who are giving their own personal view. And moreover, it's not any kind of commitment. It's just, here's our best guess right now. So, so this is not uh, a, a program where the Fed is saying, here's what we're definitely going to do, and we won't change from this. This is really just our best guess right now. And of course, they change as the uh, circumstances change. Now, what has changed in 2017 in particular was that inflation was surprisingly low. And the Fed is trying to get inflation up to its target and is actually quite comfortable with a mild overshoot of the target. And so they are adjusting their, their policies as they go. Is that perhaps a little dangerous, you know, in the sense that, um, I don't know whether academic views have changed, but uh, you know, when I 
learn from Milton Friedman, I thought that what he indicated was that monetary policy works with long and variable lags. Waiting for the inflation to reach your target before adjusting the policy, doesn't that create the danger that you're going to be too late? Well, let me, first, let me just make a very strong caveat here. I'm not going to second guess my successors here. So whatever I'm saying here, no, I'm just trying to interpret how they're talking about it. Okay, so, so they would say, first, that they have been raising rates. I mean, they have raised rates six times or whatever it is. So that, and they did that with inflation below target, in the, exactly for the point you made, that they wanted to anticipate this process. Uh, in terms of worrying about a, a big overshoot, uh, of course, that's a forecasting issue, and they're trying to figure that out. But the Fed believes, and again, I'm just reporting as I understand their thinking, the Fed believes that the so-called Phillips curve is very flat, meaning that even though unemployment is now below their estimate of the sustainable level, inflation will not go up very much from here. Right. So that's their forecast. Now, obviously, if that turns out to be wrong, they'll have to adjust one way or the other. Just going back to the question of increase in wealth, how much of an impact does that have on uh, the economy? You know, that if equity prices go up, house prices go up, that there's a permanent increase in wealth. Is the estimate of around about four cents on the dollar still well, in play? Probably, yes. But let me go back a second, which is, you know, we, before you were asking me about uh, the Fed's influences on asset prices and worrying about asset prices that are too high or spreads that are too weak. And I think that what the Fed would say is that the effects of mispricings, et cetera, if they, are, if they are mispricings, we don't know, but if they are, depends a lot on who owns and how leveraged those owners are. So to answer your question, if you look back at the uh, stock market crash of 1999-2000, that was an enormous decline in stock prices, and all we got was a relatively mild recession that lasted for eight months. Whereas in 2008, you had a much smaller asset class. Subprime mortgages were a tiny asset class. And yet, because they infected all these securities that were in turn held by highly leveraged players, including large banks and investment banks, it was enough to create this massive crash right. that hurt the economy. So I think going back to your point about, about, say, stock prices, I think the Fed is pretty relaxed about stock prices. If stock prices were to move, again, because they're held primarily by unleveraged asset holders, um, the implications for the broader economy are not so great. Likewise, uh, the, the banking system and the core of the financial system today is much stronger than it was in 2007, much more capital, for example. And so the risks of a, uh, of a sharp correction in, say, commercial real estate prices creating a, a crisis of the type, type we saw a decade ago seems much lower. Now, of course, you never know, and it's important to be continuously vigilant. But those are the kinds of considerations that the Fed would be looking at. Yeah, but I guess uh, that a concern that one must have today, uh, as opposed to 2008, is the whole uh, easiness of monetary policy globally has been associated with an increase in levels of debt that we haven't seen before. So, you know, for instance, if I look at the IMF numbers, that indebtedness, global indebtedness today is something like 30 or 40 percentage points of GDP higher than it was uh, in 2008. You know, so if there's a lot of mispricing and uh, you get correction, you know, we're dealing with a lot more debt. I, I, I take the point that uh, the leverage uh, could be limited, but there's got to be concern that, uh, you know, we get a rerun of say, something like 1998, you know, where we have an LTCM or two, uh, and then we find that the banks are exposed. So it's, it's not legitimate to add together all different kinds of debt into one number, which is what you're doing there. So you have to break it up. So, for example, a lot of the debt that the IMF is concerned about is debt in China. Okay? And, and, and China has used a lot of debt as a development technique. They essentially use bank lending as a substitute for fiscal policy. It's a very different proposition. You know, the, the, those, that debt is a very different proposition from U.S. household debt, which is actually way down from the crisis. The critical levels of debt in the U.S., first, household debt is way down. Bank leverage is way down because bank capital is much higher. Those are two critical components. Corporate leverage is up, and that's something that the Fed noticed in their minutes for the last meeting. 
But corporations are extremely profitable and cash rich right now, and, and they're not particularly exposed to these asset price movements you're talking about. So it's very important when you make, talk about debt in general that you not just add together all these different components, but that you look at who is indebted, to whom, and what assets are supporting that debt. And in situations where you have highly risky assets held by highly leveraged and critical borrowers, that's a, that's a different proposition. In the United States, at least, I don't think that's currently the situation. Yeah, well, I guess uh, we don't want to drift into uh, Europe, but, uh, you know, Italy, uh, uh, it has to be concerned yes. that, uh, you know, here we've talked about the third largest sovereign bond market. You're talking about something like two and a half trillion dollars of debt, um, and, you know, the government doesn't look too, um, too steady. But I, I see we're running out of time. Uh, let me, uh, if you'll allow me, let me just ask one final question. If we do go into recession, how should we really be uh, dealing with it next time around? You know, because it looks like, uh, you know, I, I, I just phrase the question uh, a little bit more. It looks like because of the Trump uh, budget move, you know, you're really using up fiscal space. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if a recession came pretty soon, the interest rates would still be at, at a very low level. Uh, how do you see... The right so kind yeah, of policy response. Well, uh, one would hope that fiscal response might still be possible, but you're right that the deficits we have now make it all the more difficult, both economically and politically, to do more on the fiscal side. So let's imagine, for the sake of argument, that the Fed is, you know, the only responder to this uh, decline. Well, it, it does have, first of all, it does have some space to cut rates, and that would be useful. Uh, the second tool it has is what's called forward guidance, so it could make... Uh, promises or, or forecasts about keeping rates low for a period of time or into a certain set of circumstances obtains. Those two things are pretty powerful and probably could address a moderate slowdown. Uh, a somewhat bigger recession, then that's where quantitative easing might once again become a possibility. Again, I, I want to be clear that this is not a routine tool and not one that's going to be used routinely every time the economy slows down. But if we did have a serious uh, recession which drove short-term interest rates to zero, then the Fed would certainly look at that. So those are the tools really that it has. The other thing that it's talking about generally is whether or not it would make sense over the medium term, not immediately, but over the medium term to change its framework from the current inflation targeting framework to a framework which essentially um, allows for overshoots of inflation when you're coming out of a recession. There's some so-called price level targeting. And it has the property that if you have a period like we had the last few years where inflation is below target for a long time, there's a makeup period where the Fed overshoots for a while to right. try to compensate. And if you do that and that markets understand that, that'll give you a little bit of additional power as well. But basically, the tools it has are rate cuts, forward guidance, and quantitative easing if necessary. And beyond that, I mean, I don't think there's a lot in the toolbox. Uh, how about helicopter money? You know, would that not, you know, I, I, I would have thought that one of the advantages of going the helicopter money route would be, would be that we don't have the income distribution or problems that QE might be associated with, you know, in the sense that one wouldn't be bidding up asset prices that it looks like it's the Wall Street types that are gaining and the mainstream people already, there's a perception kind of problem. If you had the helicopter money, uh, you know, it would look like it was a lot fairer than at the quantity. It reason. wouldn't actually be. It might look that way, but in any case, we're, we're pretty far from that. And I, I, honestly, I don't really have a lot of confidence that U.S. government could manage that kind of coordination, frankly. I just, I just don't see I it thought, actually happening as a practical I, matter. I thought the Air Force might be able to do the it. The Air Force, <laughs> maybe, yeah, it's possible. With that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I thought the chair just left. <laughs> I might, uh, oh, sure. Oh, um, the absence of chairs. I was just going to say a word. Um, uh, okay. Pardon? Um, if you sit next to me, because you're going to be first, and then.
Even if you said second, second, yeah. Thank you for your forbearance. Um, I'm pleased to say that uh, we've really got a very strong panel to discuss questions uh, that weren't discussed or perhaps to give us different views on the matters that I asked the chairman. Uh, and uh, what I've asked each speaker to do is to talk for about 15 minutes uh, and then uh, you know, hopefully there'll be time for uh, Q&A. Uh, I really am pleased that uh, We've assembled a very strong uh, panel who's got real expertise on this matter. Uh, the first uh, that I've asked to speak is Governor Kevin Walsh, uh, who's presently uh, a distinguished fellow at the Hoover Institution, and he teaches at Stanford Graduate School. Uh, he's more than qualified to discuss quantum easing, having served as governor at the Fed between 2006 and 2011, uh, during the period in which uh, quantum easing uh, was put in place. Uh, prior to serving at the Fed, he was Special Assistant to the President for Economic Policy and was Executive Secretary for the White House National Economic Council. Uh, Kevin will be followed by uh, Stephen Roach, uh, who's presently a Senior Fellow at Yale University's Jackson Institute of Global Affairs and a Senior Lecturer at Yale School of Management. Uh, he's especially well placed to provide us with a market perspective on quantitative easing, uh, having uh, for many years worked in the markets. Uh, he was formerly a chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia uh, and the firm's chief economist uh, for the bulk of his 30 year career there. Uh, we've got then uh, Joseph Ganyan, who's a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute, uh, who's also got. Uh, deep experience at the Federal Reserve, uh, where he served as an associate director of the Fed's Division for International Affairs, uh, and he's also worked at the U.S. Treasury. Uh, and last but not least is uh, Alex Pollock, uh, who helped me put the seminar together, and uh, who has many years uh, of banking sector experience, so we can get another market uh, view on quantum easing. Uh, Alex is a uh, Presently, a distinguished senior fellow with the Art Street Institute. Uh, previously, Alex, uh, I had the good fortune of having him as my colleague at the American In Enterprise Institute. Uh, and uh, prior to joining the AEI, uh, Alex was uh, president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago uh, from 1991 to 2004. Uh, I've, I've given the panelists a uh, choice as to whether they want to talk from the lectern or from uh, where they're sitting right now. Uh, and uh, 
Stephen might have to leave us just a little bit before uh, the end. So uh, with that uh, introduction, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what the panelists have to say. Guys, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for including me, uh, Alex. Uh, and you put together a great discussion. Um, AEI has done some incredible work, not just in monetary policy, but uh, under Arthur Brooks' leadership, have really moved the ball a lot on a range of issues. So it's certainly a pleasure to be here. Um, you heard in those first 30 minutes from a from a great great man. Uh, I have worked with him mostly in the arena for some dark days in the financial crisis. So I'll give you some reflections on that. There were two things that, uh, that Ben said that I agree with. One was that QE was a, quote, emergency measure, which begs the question what it's been doing for the last several years, which don't feel like an emergency. And he also said that it's worth having in the toolbox. And because I am somewhat modest about what we know, of what's going to happen in the global economy over the next several years. I agree with that. Um, I don't share many of the other views that were expressed. So here's what I'm going to try to do in 15 minutes. I've got some prepared remarks because uh, old habits die hard. And when we're Fed governors, they make us reduce everything to writing. Just some prepared remarks which are circling about. I think they're outside. I will speak from them, but uh, uh, I will speak loosely. Now, I'm not going to speak as loosely as Ben did when he made the wily e. Coyote reference of what happens to the economy in 2020. That is decidedly not what Fed chairmen or governors are supposed to do at any point in their careers. But he was felt very comfortable here among friends. Um, so I'm going to begin with a quote from, uh, from the CEO of the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, just to try to set the tone of where I come out. Here's what Sue Desmond Hellman once said. Whereas skepticism and uncertainty have always been the heart and soul of science, confidence and certainty are the coin of the realm in much of today's public discourse. So I'm honored to be here, as I mentioned. Um, ben was that academic star whose remarkable contributions in the crisis uh, blew most of us away. Uh, I was fortunate to be on his, uh, at his side, tasked with trying to distill some of these market signals and to try to lead a SWAT team under his leadership to respond to the crisis. And when the panic showed very few signs of abating, I was struck by this man's calmness, his wisdom, and most of all, his humility about what we knew and what we didn't know. Those character traits, including humility, are no less essential today. And unlike some of QE's loudest voices, you hear fierce attacks from QE critics and zealous support from others. Ben and I were actually present at the creation, in Dean Acheson's famous words. So neither of us have very clean hands. I need to admit that. Um, neither of us perhaps have our thoughts sufficiently detached from the decisions we made to offer a perfected judgment on QE 10 years hence. And I think it's important that we recognize that and you observe that in us. You can judge whether our launch of QE to defeat the panic makes us good scribes of this next draft of history. You can judge whether my co-authorship with Ben of QE1 in the darkest days when we were at sea in 2008 and my decision to get off the boat two years later um, to uh, approve of QE2 with him and then to leave the Federal Reserve was either wise or foolhardy. QE, this entire discussion today, seems to be getting considerably less attention than the interest rate debate, which is raging at the Fed and among pundits, um, as if the questions around QE are as certain as resolved as some would have us believe. Whether the FOMC raises rates two or three times, 50 or 75 basis points this year, strikes me as very incidental to economic growth and employment this year and next. And while they're going to put out new dots that Ben described uh, next week, which markets seem to be quite impressed by, it's not obvious to me that those dots and the relative caricature of participants as hawks and doves based on whether they have two or three more dots this year is all that important. The monetary lessons of this era will be found elsewhere. The real money, proverbially speaking, is on central bank balance sheets. So next, let me just go back a decade. Let's just do a little bit of time traveling. If with a snap of our fingers, you could eavesdrop on the discussions we had in Ben's office a decade ago, you would hear us around this time in 2008 start to conceive of the remnants of QE1. 
you would not have heard any great confidence from us about what its effects would be, what its channels would be, how we'd get out of it. Nor would you have heard us elevate the importance of QE relative to the 11 or 12 other monetary policy tools we launched on Sunday nights in the depths of the crisis. And you would certainly have heard no inkling from the likes of us uh, that a decade later the world's central banks would be killing $10 trillion of this stuff and would be adding in 2018 hundreds of billions of more of net global QE around the world. So if you traveled back in time, though, from this moment to that, and you informed us where we are, our faces would have looked more ashen than they did at the time, our spirits more sullen if you confronted us with facts of QE today. We would have figured then that with those facts, our monetary experiment must have failed. A decade of malaise must have ensued. Fiscal dominance must have prevailed. And the unwind of QE proved impossible. What we'd be particularly shocked to hear, you reporting of from 2018 to 2008, we'd be shocked to hear of the juxtaposition of peak QE in 2018 amid a global economic boom. So what if you had time traveled not back 10 years, but you went back eight, and we were back in Ben's office, where I spent three years eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, besides this great thinker and great man. If you went back eight years from to about today, you'd find us in the middle of a difficult internal debate where he pushed each other. Ben was spectacular in pushing all of us on the relative risks and rewards of employing wartime tools in what seemed to us to be the beginning of peacetime. You would hear me ask a colleague, what should we do if QE2 succeeds? And he told me then, well, we should do more of it. It made some sense. I then asked a dear colleague, what should we, should we do if QE2, which we're on the verge of launching, didn't succeed? He hesitated, he shrugged his shoulders, and he said, we might well have to do more of it. A theory deserves special scrutiny if it can't be disproved. What began as an ad hoc, necessary, risky, Fed policy response to stem a panic morphed into something else, including something like standard operating procedure. The regime changed, but it isn't obvious to me how much QE changed along with it. You would have thought that a decade, when Alex and Desmond and the group said a decade should be long enough and we'll assess how that QE experiment worked. You would have thought a decade would be sufficient to provide strong, compelling evidence of the wisdom or folly of our QE seriatim experiment, but it's not. For the central bank community evaluating QE, we're still in the thick of history. The mission accomplished signs that we hear being trotted out by some advocates should be stowed away. I am open-minded that they can be trotted out another time. But as we sit here today at the decade mark, there is no QED to QE. So what about my preliminary judgments with that bias and that pitch on humility? Policymakers confront the knowledge problem, which is dog scientists, even economists, come scientists for millennia. Central bankers have no control groups, and with QE, we neither have the benefit of historical comparison nor a natural experiment, because most of the rest of the world's central bankers replicated, remade QE policies as their own. So with these heavy heaps of humility, let me offer several judgments, but let me restate that these are unprovable at this remove. Maybe when we come here 10 years from now, we can judge the wisdom of either Ben's remarks or mine, but I'll take a shot. First, contrary to some of my conservative brethren, when I was in the engine room with Ben concocting QE1 and thinking it would work, I'm here to say that QE1 was a success, as far as we can tell. But unlike what you hear from others, it didn't work in isolation as a panic antidote. It worked in concert, however haphazardly, with other Fed talk and tools on offer. And it probably didn't work directly. Fed purchases in QE1 brought needed liquidity to illiquid markets, because it crowded in private capital. Our liquidity provision bolstered market prices, but the higher asset prices were largely the result of improved liquidity, inducing higher volumes, better matching of bids and offers, which is a different story than I often hear about QE's successors. Second, in my judgment, QE2 and its successors may have had a small positive impact on employment and output. But assigning a couple of tenths of GDP, 
a fraction of a percent of the un unemployment rate annually to incremental QE provisioning is outside the confidence interval of this profession. Increases in consumption facilitated by lower rates and higher asset prices may or may not have ultimately been offset by lower consumption in the out years and lower non-residential fixed investment, which throughout the period remained anachronistically weak. In fact, the acceleration in output uh, the acceleration in output and employment in recent quarters, including a big pickup in business capex, may well be a function of changes both in fiscal policy and monetary policy, including some clarity about the Fed's QE exit plan. Third, um, Ben said that we know how QE works and the channels work much the same way as interest rates. I'm not so sure. The effect of QE on financial assets is considerably more significant, in my view, than its effect on real assets in the real economy. Stocks, credit, and other risk assets currently trade at materially higher values than they would absent global QE. Some leading economists, many leading policymakers, seem to believe that QE is now somehow immaterial to financial asset prices. They believe that stocks and other risk assets are trading at fair and and uh, reliable prices in a durable equilibrium. It's funny, that was largely the Fed's view in the mid to late 2000s, when the great moderation was the consensus moniker for benign conditions and a rosy outlook. Many of us, myself included, deserve some bit of blame for assenting then to the notion that the US was approaching some kind of end of economic history, that the profession's knowledge was now so advanced such that significant economic shocks could be avoided. As I hear things broadly, I fear we're mistaken again. Fourth, the real returns to household wealth, which Desmond uh, queried Chairman Bernanke around, have proven significantly larger than to household income. QE, in my view, is a material part of the inequality story. The distributional effects of QE across households are significant, Despite all-time highs in stock prices and house prices, household net worth since 2007 is down for all income groups except for the top 10%. Net worth for the top decile is up an average of 27%. For the middle deciles, it's down 20 to 30% in real terms. That does not ask or answer the question whether we should have done QE last time, whether we should do it next time. But I think it suggests we shouldn't hide from the data. Fifth, and finally, inflation, which you heard in the earlier colloquy discussed, is a poor barometer of the wisdom or folly of QE2 and its successors. Prevailing theories of inflation dynamics are not sufficiently robust to allow policymakers like us to fine-tune the delta between current inflation and inflation targets based on incremental stock or flow of QE. When I hear policymakers proudly announce that inflation is only 1.76 and not 2.00, really wonder what we're doing talking about all these decimal points. Too often, inflation is used as a cudgel against QE skeptics. And to those who predicted hyperinflation, they've been referenced a couple of times, an effective rhetorical cudgel indeed. But for those of us who are actually in the arena alongside of him, the concerns we voiced are not so readily dismissed. My overriding concern about continued QE both then in 2010 and now involves the misallocations of capital in the economy and the misallocations of responsibility in our government. Misallocations seldom operate, however, under their own name. They choose other names to hide behind. They tend to linger for years in plain sight until they emerge with force at the most inauspicious of times and do unexpected harm to the economy. So finally, let me just, in the interest of time, frame the big fight, I think, in four big questions before turning over to the next panelist. So what really separates QE's fiercest advocates from its unabashed critics, of which I consider myself neither? Policymakers evaluate the benefits of risk and risks of QE differently at different points in the cycle. These differing judgments are often described to differences in forecasts, differences in weightings. But I think that explanation is a bit misleading. Four questions, it strikes me, help sort out the substantive differences among us. I'll just simply ask the four questions and 
allow you to repair to the uh, more written remarks for the answers. First, how important are price signals? In my view, price signals are everything. Price signals are precious. So when we decide to mute price signals, it better darn well be worth it. And in the depths of the crisis, my judgment was it was worth it. And during the times of somewhat greater peace and prosperity, I think hiding a price signal of the most important risk asset anywhere in the world, the 10-year treasury bond, is a uh, more tricky endeavor. But if you don't believe price signals are the end-all, be-all, if you don't think price, volatility, volume, and the rest are telling you much, and you want to make judgments based on data that comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Department of Commerce, well, that's fine. But I think these price signals matter a lot, and I don't know how to conduct monetary policy as a central bank without them. Second, how well do policymakers understand and incorporate individuals' decision-making? My answer to that is not well. But there's incredible work happening in the profession to do that better. This economy is incredibly complex. The idea that a newfangled policy like QE uh, can be understood uh, in terms of what that does to decision makers strikes me as odd. I'll give you a quote from some, one of my favorite economists, Richard Reese, who says, forecasting when the forecasts cause changes in policy, which then make people change their choices, which in turn makes it required to revise the forecast, is iteratively hard. Third, and it's not one that should be easily reduced, and I wish we had a model that could do that, and the Fed and 840 PhD economists, I hope, are working on that model, but I'd be surprised if they have it ready for prime time. Third, how should the Fed best accomplish its objectives? Well, if you think that the data that we're relying on is excellent, that we're prescient about economic developments, we're confident of the effects of our choices, I have no problems with fine-tuning GDP employment inflation targets. But if you believe what I believe, which is the knowledge problem is real, it re requires us to believe a few things. One, that business cycles and financial cycles are real, and it inclines us to want to direct the Fed's considerable monetary capabilities to offset major disturbances on the economy. We need to prepare ourselves for those. Focus on the tails, not the median. That's my view. But that is not a consensus view in the profession. And the fourth and final question in closing, how durable is the Fed's status and responsibilities? If we think that the Fed is a permanent feature of our government, then you've got really nothing to worry about. The Fed gets some right, gets some wrong, but no one would dare take on the independence and credibility of the Fed. But of course, American history tells us this is our third experiment at a central bank. And without going into detail, it's our third because the first two didn't work out so well. So in conclusion, I come to this discussion as a candid friend, both of the topic of QE where I have sullied my hands as a huge admirer of Ben Bernanke and a reappraised call for a little humility given what we've endured. We ought not to depart from today's debate and repair to the ideological conformity of our own. Ben Bernanke chose me to sit next to him before the crisis ever got going, persuaded the president I was just the guy to help with markets, and he knew that my instincts on almost every question were a bit different than his, and he wanted me by his side for that period. That is the sign of a leader. So if we decide today that we've got it all figured out, that we just hang around with everyone else who agrees with us, then I would suggest the deliberative process would be worse off, the future decision-making worse off, and we need to reverse that. So I would call for the same comparable mindset that Ben had in 2006 when we left the White House to go to the Fed to return to us now a decade after QE. Thank you. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you very much, Kevin, for such a thought-provoking uh, discussion of the issue. Uh, Stephen. Thanks, Desmond. <clears throat> and uh, I would echo Kevin. It's a real pleasure to be here in front, in front of such a uh, distinguished group of you out there, as well as those who are on the stage and who have departed from the stage. Um, and I, I was particularly struck by uh, Kevin's remarks. Um, I have spent a lot of my time uh, writing about uh, and now teaching about the Chinese economy. And your, um, your self-criticism that we just heard would make um, 
the, the Chinese are very proud. Uh, this is, they're, they're particularly good at that. Um, I say that with tongue in cheek. Um, certainly, quantitative easing is um, uh, deserving of this uh, retrospective look. Um, sure, it's too early to draw firm and hard conclusions. But I think um, you know, it goes down in history as um, the boldest experiment in the history of uh, modern central banking. The only thing comparable that I can think of, uh, quite honestly, is the um, anti-inflation campaign under Paul Volcker in 79 and 80. But that was conventional. This was unconventional and therefore um, uh, untested. Uh, you're going to get probably a lot of different lists from each of us. Kevin ended with a list of four. I'm just going to highlight uh, what I think are five lessons uh, that uh, are worth thinking about in assessing QE as we um, near this, uh, this great uh, 10th anniversary. Uh, the first one pertains to traction. The link between Fed policy and its congressionally uh, mandated objectives of maximum employment and price stability. Uh, it's already been said, and I would just echo the, um, the first part of my answer. Um, QE1 uh, was successful. Uh, it, it was successful in arresting uh, the worst part of a wrenching uh, financial crisis that uh, posed grave threats to both dimensions of the dual mandate. Um, I disagree with Chairman Bernanke, and I think I agree with Kevin, um, although he didn't quite say this, that the second uh, and third rounds, QE2 and QE3, uh, were less uh, successful than QE1, uh, and um, that, that raises the distinct possibility that um, uh, there were diminishing returns to uh, a QE traction. I think the, um, the Fed uh, operated under the erroneous presumption that what worked in crisis would work equally well post-crisis. And I think there's a little bit of rewriting history saying um, that, um, that they uh, were comfortable with the idea that uh, it may not work as well uh, going forward. I found that uh, the chairman's comments on the metrics to judge QE were uh, a, little, a little puzzling. Uh, and uh, to some extent um, a little bit d defensive. I think um, the idea that we should qualify uh, real economic growth post-crisis uh, by demography and productivity is a huge, is a, is a debate, uh, especially since the productivity uh, slowing may in fact uh, have been um, an outgrowth uh, of the, the, uh, the crisis uh, that the economy went through. The, it's pretty clear that the GDP path over the last nine years plus of 2% uh, is about half uh, the, the norm of earlier long cycles. Uh, and to dismiss that shortfall as being something um, outside um, the purview of monetary policy uh, is, is, I think, uh, something you can, you can draw into question. The, um, you know, the, the numbers, I think, are, are pretty clear that, that QE2 and 3 uh, were disappointing, both from, uh, at least the payback were disappointing, uh, as it can be seen from both the quantity and the price dimensions of the Fed's monetary policy uh, uh, transmission mechanism. The evidence on quantity, 
uh, do a back of the envelope calculation yourself. From September of 2008 to November of 2014, the end of QE3, um, successive QE programs added $3.6 trillion to the Fed's balance sheet. Over that same exact period, nominal GDP was up $2.9 trillion. So there was clearly uh, a lot more QE injected into uh, the system uh, than was reflected in um, uh, uh, the real economy. Uh, looking at the uh, evidence on uh, the impact of QE on the price dimension of monetary policy, uh, I'm left with the same conclusion uh, in, insofar as estimating its impact uh, on uh, longer-term interest rates, namely uh, the 10-year Treasury. Recent paper written by my former colleague uh, Dave Greenlaw, uh, James Hamilton, uh, Ethan Harris, and uh, Kenneth West looked very carefully at uh, the impact of QE on 10-year Treasury yields through their event studies metric uh, and drew, raised serious questions about the link between uh, QE and 10-year uh, Treasury yields. The second lesson, and I'll be a little briefer here, um, is a lesson of uh, the uh, deals with the addictive be, uh, uh, behavior uh, between uh, uh, economic decision making uh, and uh, balance sheet management uh, by the central bank aimed at supporting asset markets. Um, two pieces of, e of evidence here. One, the excess liquidity that I just cited, obviously, I think, spilled over, and, and Desmond, you were alluding to this, into equity markets. It also provided valuation support uh, to the bond market. And so to Kevin's point, which is really important that I agree with on price dis discovery, um, asset prices were shaped more by monetary authorities than by the fundamentals of um, uh, the market. Uh, and um, the second piece of the addiction uh, lesson is the impact uh, that wealth effects have on real economic activity uh, uh, post-crisis. I mean, post-crisis, uh, American consumers in particular, obliterated uh, by uh, uh, the job losses and the recession, needed uh, the wealth effects more than ever. Uh, and with the lifeline of support uh, 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 in this dark period, then, then comes the very difficult uh, pain of withdrawal. And I think that's been increasingly the case uh, uh, for the real side of the U.S. economy, but also the case, uh, and again, uh, just uh, underscore the point that Desmond was making, uh, for capital inflows into foreign economies, uh, and especially the impact of those flows uh, on um, uh, QE distorted interest rate spreads. True of the taper tantrum uh, of 2013, along with uh, uh, more current manifestations of that we're seeing in Argentina uh, and Brazil. The third lesson, uh, I'll just mention it because Kevin really did a terrific job of laying it out, is um, uh, mounting income inequality. Just remember one thing, it's pretty obvious. Wealth effects are for the wealthy. And we had a lot, a lot of wealth uh, uh, created. Um, fourth, uh, and here's where I certainly agree completely with what uh, Chairman Bernanke was alluded, alluding to, QE blurs the distinction between fiscal and monetary uh, policy. Uh, and um, the, the mounting debt burden of the United States government uh, is of little consequence today in a zero uh, interest rate environment. But make no mistake about it, the debt overhang is building hugely and as uh, has been alluded to uh, several times uh, uh, earlier today, uh, will be growing a good deal further uh, in the years ahead because of these ill-timed uh, late cycle fiscal stimulus actions. But over the, the course of the QE period, 
uh, from 2008 to 2017, uh, public uh, debt held by the uh, uh, federal debt held by the public doubled from 39 to 76 um, percent. Uh, uh, and so, um, you know, in a zero interest rate environment, big deal, no big deal. But uh, when, as rates start to normalize, um, maybe a bigger deal and America's fiscal risks uh, could then be unmasked. My fifth lesson, and this is the one where I just, as, as much respect as I have for um, uh, Ben Bernanke, this is one where I'm um, seriously at odds with him uh, uh, and his uh, predecessor uh, uh, intellectually. And that's the, the distinction between short-term tactics and longer-term strategy. As the lender of last resort, the Fed deserves great credit for stepping into the lurch and saving the financial system uh, from catastrophic uh, implosion in the depths of the crisis. The problem, of course, um, and I um, uh, say this with all due respect, is, is that the Fed, uh, in my view, under both the Chairman Greenspan and Chairman Bernanke, uh, played a role and not an inconsequential role in, condo in condoning the pre-crisis froth that took the system to the brink. And so this you know, really poses a profound and deep strategic uh, question. Do we want a reactive um, central bank that is focused on cleaning up the mess after a crisis unfolds, or is it preferable to have a proactive central bank that is willing to move before a crisis uh, hits and lean against the mounting excesses uh, in asset markets. This debate over whether to lean or clean, as they call it, continues to rage um, in policy and academic circles. Uh, and Chairman Bernanke and, and Chairman Greenspan are cleaners. Uh, and, and they have been strongly uh, in favor of this reactive approach, uh, in the case of Ben Bernanke, as an academic before he even came uh, to Washington. There's obviously a, an important political economy component uh, to this debate. Are independent central banks willing to impose a growth sacrifice on society as a price for financial stability? It also bears on the bubble spotting debate. How do you know when there's a bubble? Uh, and um, uh, therefore, how do you know when to intervene in asset markets? As difficult as those two problems and questions are, I think they pale in comparison to the cost of foregone output that has occurred in this anemic uh, post-crisis uh, recovery. Drawing vindication from uh, the supposed benefits of QE by stressing the dreaded counterfactual of chaos and collapse sweeps aside, I think, the uh, perfectly legitimate questions that can be asked about a tougher and more disciplined central bank. That's not to argue that QE1 um, was not necessary in the depths of the crisis, but it does raise questions about the subsequent commitment uh, to these um, uh, uh, different tranches uh, of QE that were argued as being essential uh, for economic uh, recovery. Uh, I worry about the Fed's preference for glacial normalization. I worried about it in the early 2000s as having set the stage for um, uh, the, the financial crisis of 08 and 09, uh, and I worry about it today. I worry about keeping monetary policy uh, in its emergency settings long after the emergency uh, has passed. The, um, uh, the point on inflation uh, is a huge um, uh, issue, and, and Kevin, um, what was the word you used? Uh, uh, a, a cudgel. What? Cudgel. Cudgel, yes. Um, I worry it's more of a foil. Inflation, you know, when, when inflation's low, central banks are forgiven uh, for anything because they say, you know, what's the big deal? You know, we have a price stability target uh, and, and, you know, we can get away with it. And, and I'm not sure that's um, uh, something that, uh, that history will judge uh, all that um, uh, kindly. So... My bottom line is um, thank you for the invitation. I love uh, anniversaries. Uh, you know, 10-year anniversaries are really special. Uh, and, um, you know, I look forward. I do have to leave a little early, so I'm, I'm going to miss 
taking a bite out of that delicious anniversary cake that I saw uh, in the hall. Um, I, we can only hope that we don't need another um, uh, unconventional policy experiment like QE. But I think in the event of another crisis, um, we need to be uh, pretty careful about looking at the shortcomings of this uh, bold experiment. And I, I have a great concern that if we try it again, and this has become a, a normal uh, part of the toolkit, uh, it may not work out as well next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joe. I have some slides. Um, so I hope someone will put them up. Are they up? Uh, while we're waiting for the slides, I guess I can get started. But um, it would be nice if the slides were up. Uh, um. Uh, let me let me just start by thanking Desmond for inviting me, <laughs> and uh, this is obviously a hugely important topic for us to be discussing. And, and big, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hugely important topic for us to be discussing, and this is a great group of people. I am uh, going to be aligning myself more with Chairman Bernanke than my panelists somewhat. Um, Kevin may remember I was also there at a lower level at the Federal Reserve at the time. Um, Everything was happening, and, and um, as I recall, each of the officers had their own special program to work on, and mine was QE. So uh, um, my job was to figure out what the hell it, it would do. Um, anyway, uh, so I, I start from the premise of that, and no one has really challenged it so far, uh, so maybe I'll get away with it, but that we are in a world of, in which the interest rates have fallen secularly, uh, for various reasons, and uh, I would point to the fact that I looked actually at some data. We have not had in the United States such a long period of such low and stable inflation since at least the 30s, if we ever had. Uh, you have to go back that far. Of course, then we had some deflation, true deflation, but um, that's how far you have to go back. So we haven't really, it's, 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 it's a trend decline in inflation, a trend decline in growth rates. Maybe some of it was endogenous to gender. We can argue about that. But for whatever reason, potential growth is down. Certainly, demographics can't be argued with. Uh, that's exogenous to the system. Aging populations raising saving. And this is happening all around the world, not just the US. So low interest rates are a global phenomenon. Uh, and yet we know that the existence of paper currency implies that we can't push interest rates uh, significantly below zero. Uh, now, it's true that in Europe and Japan, we've gone a little bit below zero for some rates. But if you actually look at what's going on, it's pretty clear that that's reached the limit of what can be done. And we haven't even got to minus one. So basically, the lesson I learned there is you can't go significantly below zero. And yet, we know that uh, when we get into uh, recessions, uh, Taylor-type rules often call for very large cuts in interest rates. And Janet Yellen famously said, um, during the March 2009 F FOMC meeting that her rule, her version of the Taylor rule, called for setting the Fed funds rate at minus six. Just not possible. Uh, ben recently, uh, just now, said he, he thought that some other models the Fed had were saying minus 450. So, uh, 4.5, rather. So, you know, that's just not possible. So what do you do? So, uh, I won't spend time on this. You could ban paper currency, which then would allow the Fed to set the rate as negative as it wants and just follow those Taylor rules right below zero. Uh, I think that's just not feasible. I would like to do that if we could, but I don't think it's feasible, feasible for many reasons, and I won't talk more about it. Uh, the second thing you could do is forward guidance, which Ben mentioned. That's basically saying if you're at zero or a little below zero, you try to persuade people you'll stay there longer. That helps a little bit, but it's not enough. You can't really go that far into the future. So let me continue on. You could raise the inflation target. No one here has talked about that. Um, that clearly would work in the sense that if we had a much higher inflation rate, uh, then when we lower the nominal rate to zero, we have a big negative real rate. And the real rate is what matters to the economy. Uh, but uh, there's, you know, raising inflation uh, but much above two would have significant costs, which we have to accept. And would we really want to do that? Now, uh, Ben proposed 
uh, a version in which you switch to a price level target at the zero bound, and he, he explained that. I think that uh, makes some sense. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, I don't think this is enough, and I think he implied he didn't think this is enough. So on to finally quantitative easing. Um, now, uh, the idea here, uh, again, as some people said, is, uh, but I guess I have a slightly different view of it than some people here. The, the idea here is that when the policy rate that you do control, it's a risk-free short-term rate, when that gets to zero, other rates are still above zero, other yields are still above zero, uh, you can buy those assets and push their rates of return down, uh, and that will help stimulate the economy and boost spending. Uh, I think uh, this, uh, uh, this is something, this is what I was working on at the time to try to figure out how much that would be, and we have very little to go on, it's true. I think Kevin was right to say that, that we need to be uh, uh, humble and, uh, you know, about how certain we can be about our policy actions and how they affect the economy, but we're forced to try. You know, whether you're proud or you're humble, you have to, as a policymaker, do the best that you think you can do. And that was what we tried to do. Um, since we uh, launched this program, uh, there's been just an explosion of research uh, on this topic, and not just in the U.S., but around the world, and not just the event studies, which some people mentioned, which are very fragile in terms of you know, how you specify the events, uh, but there's also regression analysis and looking back in history and people look back at the 60s. There's a lot of ways of getting at how QE works uh, that are very clever out there. And the amazing thing is that you know, 90 plus percent of these studies all agree uh, and find a relatively uh, reasonable range of the effects. Uh, there was one study mentioned that came out after my uh, 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 a, um, survey which did find a much smaller effect. It was an event study, which I think uh, made an unfortunate choice of events, which didn't make sense. But uh, by far, I mean, it's the uh, vast majority of studies all agree on a positive uh, effect in a reasonable range, which is very unusual for those of you who do empirical research to get everyone to agree so quickly. And when I talk to central bankers around the world, the effectiveness of QE is just widely accepted, and it's many people just think it's now going to be a, a routine tool. So this is where I disagree with my colleagues. Now, someone mentioned, and many people have mentioned, well, QE1 clearly held a huge effect, but the other QEs didn't have as much effect. I actually agree with that. In fact, in my uh, paper, uh, not this one, but an earlier one I wrote with some colleagues, we indeed found that QE1 dollar for dollar was twice as powerful as, as the other QEs. And that is right. It was during a crisis. It had really big uh, calming effects on the market. Uh, and those event studies found big effects. But we found that, in fact, just looking at what government does with uh, managing bond supplies in normal times has an effect, you know, the debt management policy. Uh, and so other studies of QE in other countries and later on after the crisis find that it still has an effect. So basically there's a, there's a steady state effect, which is not diminishing, it's just pretty constant. And then there's a crisis effect, which is much bigger. And that's right. But even though the steady state effect is small, it's, 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 it's enough to be worth doing. Um, let's see. And I think we could think about doing it in other assets. We focused on government bonds only. I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, so what would I do? Well, I would uh, say we should probably have a nominal GDP growth target. I have a lot of uh, empathy, sympathy with the market monetarists, who some of you may know, who think that the Fed's main job is really keeping nominal spending up and growing. Uh, I would take a target of 5%. Uh, I would do what Ben said in, in, at the zero bound. When you hit the zero bound, then you try to make up past losses, and that gives you some more power of your policy. But I would use QE also at, at the zero bound. Uh, acknowledging the uncertainty still, um, 300, it seems like this, the central core of the estimates for the U.S. is that $300 billion of purchases is equivalent to a 25 basis point cut in the Fed funds rate. That, that's the steady state effect, not the prices effect. Uh, yeah, that's uncertain. It's a bit more uncertain uh, as to the effect on the economy than regular policy, but it, it's, it's our best guess and it, it's worth acting on. It'd be nice if the Fed could do more than just uh, affect the term premium. Um, let's see. And then we could make this systematic. This Fed should just systematically do whatever it needs to do to achieve its nominal GDP uh, goal.
goal and, and just focus on that. Uh, and if you, there's a, a rule proposed by Lars Svensson, a Swedish economist, he used to be uh, deputy governor of the Riksbank. He thinks monetary policy should basically always be set so that uh, your forecast to hit your goal in about three years, after, you know, which is sort of the peak point for monetary policy effectiveness, and you cross-validate that with private sector forecasts, and if they agree with you, then maybe you're doing the right thing. Uh, I think this may be a way to make it more systematic. Now, what, what are the lessons learned? Well, I think it's a little interesting listening to uh, everyone today that the same large event that was so important, uh, uh, we seem to be learning different lessons from it. So I think this is very important that we talk today and that we uh, continue to write to see, see how, why is it we're distilling different lessons from the same uh, events. My uh, sense, uh, and this is what uh, uh, Ben also said, is when I look at all the effects of quantitative easing, they are identical. I'm struck by how identical they are to mon conventional monetary policy. The effect on the macroeconomy and spending, the effect on uh, international spillovers on the dollar, the effect on the distribution of income, they're all there and they're all worth talking about, but they're no different from conventional monetary policy. It's just a way of getting past the zero bound. Um, so I don't see any need for special scrutiny of QE. Uh, now, I would say in terms of lessons, why when we had such a big QE program and three rounds and $3.6 trillion at the purchases, uh, which, by the way, is not the same as a $3.6 trillion deficit. It's just an asset swap, uh, which is now being unwound gradually. Uh, now that we have better estimates of how QE works, our best guess is that QE1 at the time was the equivalent of a one and a half percentage point cut in the Fed funds rate. Okay? That's significant. That's a big cut. But the models, the Taylor rule models that we were using, called for anywhere from a four to a six percent cut. So it was anywhere from a quarter to a third of the size that our own economic models said we should do. So then why would we be surprised when we get a weak recovery? I, I find this hard to, to grasp, why people find that uh, a, a, a surprise. I was not surprised, and as soon as I left the Fed in the fall of 2009, I was writing that QE was way underpowered and needed to be a lot bigger, and the fact that the Fed came around and did more later, in my view, sort of uh, proves that point. So far, QE has been enormously profitable. The Fed has never had such large profits for a decade now in a row. Uh, its profit level has tripled for 10 years in a row running. Uh, and the Fed has studied the, eff to the effect on future uh, profits and what might happen. And uh, there is no realistic scenario in which uh, QE will cause a loss to the Fed balance sheet if you accumulate over the whole program, including into the future. Uh, now, in Europe, I think the same result will be true, um, but I haven't seen it studied. In Japan, uh, Bank of Japan profits are up, but there I would recognize that there's a very real chance that the Bank of Japan will lose money uh, over the whole program when all is said. So, um, uh, yes, so anyway, so uh, I will not talk about macroprudential policies. I think. Uh, they're very important, but I don't think that monetary policy is really the one that's worth doing. Um, okay, so final slide. Uh, I, think, uh, I think it would be useful to let the Fed buy any financial asset. It's the only central bank of a major economy that doesn't have that power, uh, and I don't know why. Uh, I, 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 people talk about asset allocation and credit, uh, distorting the asset markets, it seems to me it's quite distortionary to force the Fed to only ever give credit to the federal government. Uh, why isn't the neutral policy one in which the Fed's portfolio is just the market's portfolio and let the market decide how to allocate assets and let the Fed just follow? Uh, that seems to me the natural benchmark and the Fed should conduct QE in the market basket, uh, market portfolio of assets. Um, one issue uh, with this would be it would make the distributional concerns greater, which some people have raised. So my final point is another option would be to allow helicopter money. I know that's not QE, but Desmond, you raised it. Uh, I actually think um, it could work. Uh, obviously, it raises 
uh, accountability issues in our democracy, what perhaps could be done is uh, if the Federal Reserve Act was amended so that the Fed could do helicopter money under these three conditions. One, your policy rate is at zero and stuck. Two, you're not achieving, you're underachieving your inflation and employment objectives, so you're below your objectives mandated by Congress. Three, the Treasury, Treasury Secretary approves and signs off. If those three conditions are all met, then the Fed would be able to mail out checks to households, uh, and the amount would be set by the Fed uh, based on what it thinks the macroeconomy needs to achieve its goals mandated by Congress. The key thing would be Congress would determine the distribution formula. Is it the same for every person? Is it the same for every household? Is it the proportion of your previous year's income tax? What is it that the Fed should do? Congress sets that. Uh, uh, but uh, the Fed would then determine the amount. I think this could work, and it would be democratically accountable. And finally, I would think it should be backed by uh, an automatic draw on Treasury securities uh, so the Fed would you know, balance, she would balance. And that's where I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, well, it's, it's really very good that we've got uh, different views. Uh, Stephen, you need to go. Uh, Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Desmond and ladies and gentlemen. A famous line, which you'll know of John Maynard Keynes, is soon or late it is ideas which are dangerous for good or evil. And I think a key lesson of quantitative easing, and especially post-crisis quantitative easing, is the ideas of those who run fiat currency central banks. As these ideas change over time and go in and out of central bank fashion, are extremely important for good or evil on a very large scale indeed. Now, it's interesting to contrast the ideas of post-crisis QE, uh, because let me say parenthetically, the Fed was created to cope with crises. That's why it exists. And you do things in crises that you shouldn't do other times. So contrasting the ideas of post-crisis QE uh, to an earlier set of Federal Reserve governing ideas is, I think, quite instructive. I refer to the 1950s and 60s ideas of the Fed under Chairman William McChesney Martin, where the Fed adopted a bills, what was called the bills only policy. Let me remind you what this meant. It meant that the only asset that the Federal Reserve bought and sold and held in open market operations were short-term treasury bills. Why did they think that? It's, it's hard to imagine something more completely different as an idea of a central banker than QE and especially post-crisis QE. Uh, the reason they said it was because, uh, I think disagreeing, Joe, with the point you made, that they thought that, was, that would have the least possible impact on the cost of long-term capital. And they also thought that the Fed should never try to allocate credit uh, among, among uh, uh, various economic sectors. As I said, this is clearly the opposite of the theory of post-crisis QE. It's not a policy for a crisis, but it has something to say for it as a policy for all the rest of the time, like now, because, of course, we are, to use Kevin's words, back to peacetime. The crisis has been over four years. Well, let me ask you, how many Treasury bills does the Fed own today? No, the panel knows. The answer is zero. Uh, zero. And it has been for years. So over 50 years, the ideas of those running the Fed have gone from believing that only Treasury bills should be held uh, in their portfolio to having no Treasury bills uh, whatsoever. So I take as another lesson of the QE experience this. Do not look for the ideas of central bankers to be eternal verities. Uh, they aren't, uh, and they can't be. In the credit crunch of 1966, 
which was created by the Fed's interest rate regulations. Yes, the Fed used to believe in interest rate regulations uh, as well. Uh, mortgage funds dried up. Savings and loans, then politically powerful, believe it or not, were unhappy, and many in Congress wanted the Fed to buy the bonds of Fannie Mae and the federal home loan banks in order, of course, to support housing. Uh, the Fed did not wish to do this. Uh, it was still William McChesney uh, Martin, who pointed out that this was simply credit allocation uh, by the Fed. He described it as a diverting open market operations from general economic objectives to the support of specific markets for credit, which was exactly what the idea was. Uh, he objected that this would violate a fundamental principle of sound monetary policy. Uh, that is, it would attempt to use the credit-creating powers of the central bank to subsidize programs benefiting special sectors of the economy, and therefore we shouldn't do it. Well, of course, the mortgage-backed part of QE is precisely credit allocation uh, to a sector housing. Uh, however, uh, however right uh, Martin may have been about this, I think he was right, uh, it's also the fact that Congress loves nothing better than to subsidize and over-leverage real estate. It's their favorite activity, and it gets us into trouble again and again. So here was the message uh, from Congress, delivered by a senator quite prominent in his day, Senator Proxmire, in a 1968 hearing. Uh, Kevin, I pick up your thought here about don't assume that the Fed is institutionally always the same uh, over time. Said Proxmire to the Federal Reserve representative, you recognize, I take it, that the Federal Reserve Board is a creature of the Congress, that we can create it, abolish it, and so forth. Uh, what would Congress have to do to indicate that it wishes the board to change its policy and give more support to housing. Uh, well, I presume had Senator Proxmire still been alive today, he would be a fan of permanent QE. Uh, the new Fed chairman, beginning in 1970, was not William McChesney Martin, it was Arthur Burns. And Arthur Burns then, considering this discussion with the Congress, uh, came to believe, in his own words, that the Fed should demonstrate a more cooperative attitude. So by the 1980s, uh, I think this is very little known, in fact, the Fed's bond portfolio uh, evolved to include the debt of Fannie Mae, the federal home loan banks, the federal farm credit banks, the federal land banks, the federal intermediate credit banks, the Bank for Cooperatives, the United States Postal Service, Ginny May, the General Services Administration, the Farmers Home Administration, the Export Import Bank, and the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. That means that the Fed was funding the Washington, D.C. metro system, a pretty clear example of uh, favoring a particular economic sector, and look how far this can, can get away. Uh, along with, uh, with uh, helping uh, finance the subway for Washington, the Fed was financing Fannie Mae, which was insolvent in those days on a mark-to-market -market basis, and the utterly broke farm credit system was bonds it was also buying. Now still, we have to say that at the peak, all of these together only totaled about $9 billion, or about 0.2% uh, of the Fed's current balance sheet size. So let's review, because we really haven't uh, talked about the exact numbers, uh, where the Fed's balance sheet is now, as of May 30th. Uh, treasury bills, zero. Long-term, or longer-term, Treasury securities, 2.4 trillion. Uh, Mortgage-backed securities, which Carter Glass is looking down from financial Valhalla. I'm sure he's got a stomachache still over this. Uh, $1.8 trillion, $1.8 trillion in mortgages funded with floating rate deposits. This makes the Fed, in effect, the biggest savings and loan uh, in the world. 
Uh, maybe in the crisis we needed the Fed to be the world's biggest savings and loan. Do we now? The total assets of the Fed are, uh, as of May 30th, $4.3 trillion. Its total capital is $39 billion, giving it a leverage of 110 uh, to 1. They probably are in number one among American financial institutions in that way. And this is, again, in, uh, to use Kevin's term, in peacetime. Now we know, and it has been said, these immense portfolios are running very slowly off. They're not being sold. Among the other reasons for not selling uh, is that the Fed doesn't want to face the very large losses in its super leveraged balance sheet that it would realize by selling. Uh, however much profits they have, may have booked in the past, Joe, the profits by of the uh, losses of selling would be, or could conceivably be, many times the total capital uh, of the Fed, and given these very large potential losses, uh, it is easier to just go into runoff and have it take very long. And uh, the lesson is it's a lot easier to get into a large QE programs uh, than to get out. And thus, the exit strategy, and we know the Fed thought long and carefully about exit strategy, but it's still hard to do, is constrained to be very gradual constraint being the, the recognition of losses, which they would not like uh, to do, uh, and, and the uh, gradual strategy is, is combined with the hope that the adjustment in the very highly inflated house prices of this country and the inflated stock and bond prices will also be gradual. Well, maybe they will or maybe they won't. Uh, this is especially true of the inflated house prices because that, of course, touches a much broader swath of American households since 64% of American households own, own, their, own their house and are affected by these prices, and they are, in very many cases, highly leveraged. So let's move to another QE lesson, and this one I think is, uh, is absolutely fundamental. In principle, a fiat currency, not, not a gold standard central bank, but a fiat currency central bank, can make unlimited investments in anything financed by monetization. Uh, the Federal Reserve is a champion investor in mortgages, as we've said. The European Central Bank owns corporate bonds, uh, government agency bonds, regional and local government debt, asset-backed securities, and covered mortgage bonds, among other things. The Bank of Japan, as has been mentioned, owns equities and asset-backed securities in addition to an ocean of a Japanese government debt. Uh, the Swiss National Bank owns huge amounts of foreign currency bonds, foreign currency relative to it, a huge portfolio of U.S. Uh, equity securities, and uh, in addition, loans to the Switzerland's own mortgage companies that are sort of like the federal home loan banks. Uh, an interesting thing to note is that the Swiss central bank is required to mark these securities to market and does and runs them through its profit and loss statement. This is a discipline the Federal Reserve sedulously uh, avoids. Uh, all of these involve, all of these strategies involve credit allocation, of course, with the Fed, the two allocations that it has favored are housing, uh, Senator Proxmire would have been pleased, and financing uh, the government deficit. But the only limits to what a fiat currency central bank can finance without limit and can therefore subsidize uh, are uh, the law and the ideas that govern uh, their, their behavior. Well, uh, what should we be, we be doing now? Uh, and what should the future uh, bring to this? We might say that whether there, having said that political constraints are one of, along with ideas, are the constraints on central bankers, I believe the future political constraints on QE will depend on how the QE experiment ultimately turns out. 
And that we don't know because the exit has barely begun. So over time, we'll see how it turns out. Uh, I said that the, uh, the adjustment is very gradual. Therefore, we hope for a gradual adjustment. In other words, a soft landing, but it might be a hard landing. If it's a hard landing, you can imagine the Congress uh, wanting to get involved in, uh, in reforming uh, the Federal Reserve uh, with, with res respect to this. And, and all these things we simply uh, don't know yet. But what should the Fed uh, be doing now? Charles Goodhart, that distinguished dean of thinking about central banking, recently wrote, it's generally agreed that where the quantitative easing involved directional elements uh, to support credit flows through critical but weak markets, for example, the mortgage market in the USA, such assets should be entirely run off, uh, leaving the direction to market forces, and the, and the assets left in the central bank's balance sheet should be entirely in the form uh, of government debt. Uh, and with all due respect to the ghost of Senator Proxmire, uh, that seems right to me. But as Goodhart continues, it doesn't answer another big question which QE makes us ask. What is the optimal size of a central bank's balance sheet? How much QE should there, should there ever be? Uh, can, and there's another question, can central banks successfully practice credit allocation over time without messing things up? And further, how should we understand the respective roles of the Treasury and the central bank? This is another way of talking about fiscal policy or monetary policy. Uh, are the Treasury and the central bank really two things or really only uh, one thing? Uh, and further, in this country, are the Fed, the Treasury, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac four things or really only one thing? Well, there are all these, these questions. So I close with a final lesson uh, of, of QE, which is we won't know what the final lessons are until after the exit is completed. Uh, and Kevin pointed out, history didn't end in 2007, but history never ends in each set of actions we take, uh, certainly in economics and finance, uh, raise additional new problems uh, that we then have to address in the future. I thank you very much, Alex. I think that the hour is late. Uh, you know, we've got something like 10 minutes for questions. I think we'll just take a few questions from the audience. Uh, if anybody's got a question, if they could just raise their hand and somebody will bring a mic to you. And uh, I'll take a few questions and then just pass that on to the panelists. Thank you. Uh, let's take another question, this gentleman. It was alluded to by the last speaker, but when do we know when QD is QE, uh, uh, QE has ended? Or <laughs> uh, are there any other questions? Get one back here. Does it? Oh, okay. So I was just wondering if we could learn from the experience of other countries where it seemed like the ones that kind of dragged their feet on it, in particular the Euro area, you know, they seemed like they're the last ones in and they're going to end up being, you know, some of the longest, uh, you know, lasting programs as a result. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Joe, would you like to? Sure. All right. Let me, let, I'll, I'll take the, the first and the, the third question, if that'd be good. Um, and in fact, they're related. Um, and I like the way you put it, uh, by the way. 
Um, when QE first happened, two central banks went in quickly, relatively boldly, although I would argue in hindsight not boldly enough, but given the uncertainties, it was a reasonable thing that we did. Um, and two central banks hung back, and I think they needed it, but they didn't do it, and that was your, your ECB in Japan. And I think the lesson I learned from that is that if you are timid, the more timid you are in an, in an environment of growing deflationary expectations or disinflationary expectations um, that get entrenched, it makes your job in the future harder because you're going to have to go against these entrenched disinflationary expectations and that is hard. And it's better to act quick before that gets set in. So uh, I do think that what you said is exactly right. Uh, because they were slow to enter, they're actually going to be doing much more than they would have had to do otherwise and doing it much longer. And that, to me, is a lesson I learned. Um, and in particular on Japan, yeah, I, I think Japan is really where uh, the limits of QE are to be seen. Uh, because they have 10-year bond yields at zero, literally zero. I never thought that was possible. If you had asked me 10 years ago, I wouldn't have believed it was possible. Uh, it can't go any further. Uh, I mean, you, you could just hold uh, $100 bills in a safe and get a better return than a 10-year JGB. So why would you ever hold it? So that is the limit of QE in that space. Now, I think they could do some more equity. They're doing a bit of equity. They could do more. Uh, the Central Bank of Hong Kong actually did a, a very large equity purchase in 1998 in a crisis, and it had wonderful, good effects, and they were able to get out of it successfully. So it was an example of a QE exit, by the way, that, that we did see that worked. Uh, now, there's no guarantee that it's always going to work. If you do QE without a strategy, without a disciplined framework, the way Senator Proxmire was, was urging people to do, and you slowly get in and you have no idea what you're doing or what the limits are, the goals are, that's a, a disaster. You have to have a sense, what, is you, what are you trying to achieve, and you stop when you achieve it. And um, I fear that Japan has come too late to that. They now have a better framework, but boy, those... Uh, low inflation expectations are so entrenched. Um, I think the only answer for them would have been for a joint government a fiscal monetary program that included wage increases for all government workers with a plea to the private sector to do the same and then monetize that to get back to inflation expectations of 2%. That is the only thing that I think would work and they haven't done it yet. Uh, just, uh, I might just uh raise a question here is that Joe seems to think that long-term interest rates, there's a floor at zero, but there's something like $13 trillion of sovereign bonds, you know, for instance, like Germany and so on, that are trading at negative interest rates, you know, long-term. Uh, you know, that, that might be one of the distortions that we've had from quantitative easing. But uh, let me ask uh, Kevin, uh, you know, just to comment, because it seems like big disagreement between Kevin and uh, Joe is that Kevin seems to think uh, that uh, it's very important not to distort prices, particularly of a very important asset like the 10-year bond. Uh, and you seem to be concerned about asset price inflation and the credit spreads getting too compressed. Joe seems to be rather relaxed about all of that. Uh, I mean, of course, We'll have a uh, seminar uh, when all of this uh, comes to an end, the unwinding. Uh, but in anticipation of the seminar, I just thought you might want to uh, elaborate uh, on your concern. Sure. So, so thank you. So, so a couple of things. First, Joe is brilliant, and we were incredibly fortunate. I say this with all sincerity to have colleagues like him with us in the crisis. That blue sky thinking we were doing in Ben's office hour after hour was informed by the brilliance of about 20 Fed economists. And so some of these ideas that he put forth today, which I consider sheer madness, um, were quite interesting and useful to force us to think. So, so while I disagree with him on a lot of things, this is what the institution's supposed to be. This is what separates the Fed from, dare I say, other institutions across the United States government to have that kind of open thinking and rigorous discussion. He called his paper QE an underappreciated success. Well, um, 
it seems as though I would describe it somewhat differently. It is a success, it is a great triumph for those of us assembled in this room. I mean, this is really couldn't have worked out better for all of us, couldn't it? So if you happen to own financial assets, I really can't find a better way to have us all um, uh, uh, improve our, our relative net worth. The only problem is 52% of our fellow Americans have no financial assets. And we wonder why and how has happened to our politics. Now to the question that, that uh, Desmond, that you asked about price setting and the rest, um, I'll say two things. First, um, I am open-minded to these cross-country comparisons. Um, but the United States is different than the rest of the world and has been since 1946. The productivity we've driven, the uh, increase in standards of living, not because we're clones of anyone else, but because we practiced a different kind of economics and politics uh, really through the most recent era. So often in these discussions, often when I was at the Fed, what we would hear from colleagues who are incredibly learned is if you don't do this, you'll be Japan. Well, that's more of an ad hominem attack than it is a deep understanding. The way I'll state that simply is the micro foundations of macro are essential and they diverge markedly between the United States and our trading partners around the world. So these comparisons, I think, offer far less than, than meets the eye. Finally, on the question of uh, price setting and the rest, um, if you don't know what the 10-year risk-free rate is, it is impossible to value any asset anywhere in the world because we would take that risk-free rate set in open markets, as would everyone uh, in other countries. They would add term premia, credit premium, inflation premia, liquidity premium, and the rest. And so I think it's asking ourselves for tail risks if we can't be certain of what that risk-free rate is. This is why historically, even as the Fed wandered away from a bills-only policy, we decided that we did not want to go all the way out in the yield curve unless exigent circumstances dictate it because we believe that that risk-free rate really mattered. None of us know what that risk-free rate should be. And finally, I'll just say, we, we have heard a discussion today, and you hear it very commonly, about this low trend growth. And now people are championing this low trend growth that we've had of 2% between 2010 to 2016. Well, it's funny, um, Desmond, in 2009, the Fed started making public our forecasts. And in 2009, we did not think we were in a crisis. We forecasted that GDP growth in 2010 would be 4.5%. 2010, we predicted that the economy would grow in 2011 at 4.2%. And now the story we're told is, oh, it was demographics, it was productivity, you know, the secular stagnation is real, we need to lower expectations. <laughs> um, the only thing we actually can forecast is demography. And if that's really the story, then the Fed has quite a lot to account for, for why we thought there would be a rosy scenario then if it didn't have something to do with actual conduct of public policy. Desmond, Alex, I'll give I, you the last word. I'd, I'd like to answer the gentleman's question about when we know... QE is over. I think it's a very relevant question. I'd say it'll be over for the Federal Reserve when the Federal Reserve owns no mortgages, no mortgage-backed <laughs> securities, and when at least half of its treasury securities are short-term bills and not notes and bonds. Uh, it'll be over for the Swiss National Bank when it has fully liquidated its portfolio of U.S. stocks and similarly, I'd say, for, other, uh, for the other central banks. Maybe Maybe you mean that it'll be over when the leopard lies with the lamb. <laughs> <laughs> or changes your spots. <laughs> okay, on that note, uh, I just want to thank uh, my panelists and uh, assure you that when something big happens on this quantitative easing saga, we'll convene to discuss it again. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to meet you. I really love that. Oh, you can.